This is an introduction to the Maya. There are fundamentally two spheres of influence in Mesoamerican history. One of them is often referred to as Mexican, and I'd like you to think of Teotihuacan, as well as the Aztecs in this region over here of Mexico. There is also the Maya sphere of influence. And uh, in the Yucatan Peninsula, for example, we have the lowlands, uh, Maya lowlands, and we also have the highlands, uh, in particular running into Guatemala. What I'd also like you to see is that both of these connect with uh, Olmec, Olmec territory. So both of them have an opportunity to be exposed to uh, what I'm referring to as the mother culture. These two separate cultural areas also traded and interact. So while they are distinct and have unique features, nevertheless, there are shared ideas that go back and forth between the two of them. I don't want you to think of them as totally isolated. The Maya create about 50 separate city-states, each of these having a dynastic ruler, a ruling elite. Uh, the rulers of these cities were generally considered to be divine, so we are dealing with uh, god kings in each of the city-states. There is no single kingdom, though. There's no one ruler who rules over all of the others. It will be a period in history when the Maya do tend to compete with each other, so there will be from time to time warfare between some of the city-states. One of the features of the Maya that make them particularly compelling is that they are the only fully literate folks from the New World. Oh, the Maya have left us writing, which is based on sounds and syllables, and we are fortunate enough to actually have some texts that survived the conquest. There are four books. Uh, they're referred to as codices, or I have a sample of one. Uh, a, the singular is codex. Uh, this is located in Dresden. It's generally considered to be the most important of the four books because it's most fully illustrated. It is also from the 13th or the 14th century, which means it's before contact or before the conquest of the New World by the Spanish. So it gives us a good window into the ideas, beliefs, and clearly the writing of the ancient Maya. Uh, today, I would estimate there's over 50% of the Mayan hieroglyphs that have been translated. This is a continuing process that is ongoing, but we certainly do have enough information to be able to understand some of the basic ideas about the Maya and their culture. Another bit of good news is many of the centers of the Maya, of these city-states, such as the one on the bottom left, which is a photograph of Tikal, a recent photograph of Tikal. Uh, these were somewhat remote from the regions where the Spanish actually settled. They also very quickly, after the sites became abandoned, um, were overgrown by a uh, jungle. Consequently, they were protected pretty much from looting and from disturbance and from the looting by the Spanish, by the way, until we get to the 18th or the 19th centuries when Western scholars begin to visit and begin to investigate these sites. It will be at that time that the term classic is applied to describe the period in which the Maya flourish. Uh, the term, of course, was applied by Western scholars and people who were adventurers interested in learning about the Maya, and it is borrowed from the Greco-Roman world. And what it really is, I guess you could say, is a complement to the achievements of the Maya. Uh, it indicates the highest achievement period in the New World, but it also consequently does reference a Western bias at the same time. On the other hand, the Maya are particularly impressive folks. They do give us writing. They give us very sophisticated art and architecture. They give us a calendar system. And they also, as we're going to see shortly, uh, very clearly investigated the skies and even left monumental observatories to record their interest in the skies and in the calendar. Let me start us off with a sample that might help you to understand why Western scholars did, in fact, uh, decide that the Maya belonged to a classic period, a fluorescence, essentially, in the New World. Uh, this is a simple cop 
but it is richly decorated with a very, very sophisticated design. Um, this is what the cup would have looked like, and it probably would have been used in feasting. It could have been given as a gift. It would have been a prestige item. And these uh, cups often, in fact, end up in tombs, which is the way in which they remain intact. Uh, the cup would have probably held a chocolate drink, which was highly revered by the ancient Maya. Uh, it is impossible to see all of the image on the cup at once. So if we're lucky, we get a rollout and that's what we're looking at on the screen right over here. Uh, this is a rollout, essentially a photograph of everything that you would see if you held the cup in your hand and you actually turned it. And that was the intention of the artist who was creating this. Uh, the image that I've selected to focus on, in fact, is of uh, the maze god and if we go up here at the top this image right here depicts the maze god uh, but the maze god as a scribe or as an artist so i'm beginning us with an actual depiction of an artist we can recognize the maze god by the particular necklace this is the emblem of the maze god and also by the headdress that the maze god is wearing which you might recall uh, references a kind of corn plant or if you wish to think of it it would not be wrong i think to think of it as a world tree the maze god also is wearing a headdress that terminates in those amazing kessel feathers which we're going to see again uh, very shortly the style of this image is incredibly sophisticated uh, the figure is very very elegant and the overall feeling of the vessel is a complexity of design uh, the artist also has simply avoided leaving any empty spaces and that's one of the things that i think is both great and frustrating about mayan images because sometimes there's so much on the surface it becomes difficult to, to make out uh, the central figure or the story it is created with very slow moving lines. I'm calling them languid. Uh, these are lines um, laid down by the artist, continuous lines laid down by the artist to create images that are often narrative. They often uh, relate some activity or perhaps even a story. Uh, therefore, I'm gonna say there's a kind of dynamic quality to the paintings in that they're often are figures that are shown moving. And in this case, our maze god, who is a scribe, who is acting as an artist, is leaning over. So it's a little bit asymmetrical, a little bit off balance, a little bit of a sense of motion. Um, he is in the act of putting a line down. Um, these are in fact often uh, asymmetrical images. They also consist of what we would call composite poses. And that would be a combination of frontal. And if you look at our God's body, you're gonna be able to see we're looking at his torso in particular from the front, uh, but his face is most clearly in profile. Uh, this is a fairly universal approach uh, in the new world uh, to creating the human figure, but it also was used in uh, ancient Mesopotamia, it was used in the, uh, the early cultures of the old world as well. These uh, images are very, very richly decorated and they're also highly symbolic. Um, in order to recognize the maze god, you have to recognize the necklace, you have to recognize the headdress, and you have to also know that the maze god was a patron of scribes and that he could act as a scribe himself. This is generally referred to as codex style. And the reason for that is it looks a lot like a page from the codex that I just showed you. It is filled with line uh, and also with very limited color. Uh, the line itself is fluid, continuous, and very controlled. And the background goes over uh, a cream slip. Uh, the variations in line that occur, we believe, are due to the uh, changes in the amount of water that would be added to the pigment. So some of it would be lighter, some of it would be darker. Uh, the vessels generally have a red rim at the top. You can see that down here. And some kind of um, at the base, some kind of a terminating area 
that puts everything into, I'm going to call it a page uh, format to kind of frame the images. Uh, these images are usually of mythic or supernatural uh, beings, and that's certainly going to apply to the maze god. Uh, he is accompanied by a second figure. The second figure is a carver. So what we really have here are two examples of artists. And I think that's a good way to begin the Maya because I would like you to know that uh, the artist was considered uh, highly respected within Maya society. Okay. Uh, this is another example. It is an image that you could find in Yale University. Um, it is a Maya seated scribe and it is a depiction that again uh, shows us a scribe. This time he is holding a conch shell, and that's what this thing is right here. Um, a conch shell was used to hold paint. So our artist is in the act of getting ready to paint or to write. And these little circles coming down to the conch shell uh, represent water that is coming into the conch shell. Apparently the pigment needed to be mixed with water and depending on how much water would determine the degree of darkness of the pigment itself. I think you can suspect from uh, the costuming, the jewelry, the headdress of the scribe in this image that artists were highly respected. Artists were scribes and they were usually members of the elite. They were part of the royal family, perhaps. Uh, they were individuals who were carefully educated and they definitely could write and paint. Writing among the Maya was, I'm going to say, jealously guarded. It was something that was kept to uh, the domain of the elite. It was a kind of control, essentially. Uh, the patron of scribes could be the maze god. There was other, uh, there was another god as well, the howler monkey god, who is also a, a god associated with being a patron, a protector for the arts. Um, and that would include sculpture as well as painting and um, music, uh, dance, uh, in addition to that. Uh, so sometimes the two divine creatures overlapped in their protection and guidance of the scribe. Uh, the artist who is scribe here uh, would have been a very, very respected and in the world of the Maya, um, some, not all, but some of the artists actually did sign their works. It was also believed that creativity came to individuals from the gods and that writing itself, which is the foundation for painting, essentially, as it would be uh, for elite paintings in China, uh, that writing uh, was created uh, by the supreme uh, Maya deity, Itzama, who was the creator god. So the creator god is also a kind of cultural hero who gives writing to people. One last thing to mention here, as well as in the image of the maze god that we just looked at, is the elongated flattened forehead, which is one of the characteristics of Maya elite. And honestly, I think it's one of the elements of style because the exaggerated line of the nose running up to the forehead adds a kind of elegance to the art that the Maya paint and also sculpt. This is a depiction of Lord Pakal. He was the divine ruler at Palenque. That's where we're going to go next. This is a stucco head which was found from or was found in Pakal's tomb. It is an amazing piece of stucco work. The face of Pakal is calm, it is dignified, it is a perfect image for a ruler filled with confidence uh, and certainty in terms of his rank. It's also elegant and very ornate. The line of the nose again is exaggerated uh, to run directly from the tip of the nose up to the top of the head. At the very, very peak of the head, you're going to see a tuft of feathers pulling forward, and those bring us back down and echo the shape of the nose. Those feathers are a reference to the feathers of the Quetzal. We've already seen this. I have a couple more pictures of birdies for you with enormously 
gorgeous plumage, an iridescent blue-green. And again, these would have been up to three feet in length, and they would have been uh, collected by and worn in the elite costumes of Maya Rulers. This life-size stucco head of Lord Pakal also has a bead located right here, and you can see it here, which helps again to accent the nose line and link the nose with the plumage coming down from the crest, creating an extraordinarily striking uh, profile for our figure. This would be an example of cranial deformation, and I have uh, another photograph. It is upper left. Uh, it comes from Bun and Pack, and it too shows, I think, slightly exaggerated, which is a part of the art style, to create an elegant line on the forehead. But it does reference cranial deforma deformation. Okay, why would uh, someone do this? Well, first of all, it's done when uh, an infant is shortly after an infant is born and the skull is soft. All you have to do is wrap material around the head to encourage the development of the skull in uh, the shape that you prefer. It doesn't hurt the baby in any way and it doesn't damage the brain capacity in any way. What it does do, however, is to create an elongation to the head. At least that's the decision that the Maya made aesthetically in terms of the design that they use for cranial deformation. Uh, for the Maya, this was done because it was considered to be beautiful, and it does accent the nose line, adding an elegance to the works that were created. It's also a sign of the elite uh, because it was done within the royal family and the nobles within the Maya community. And it does give you a sense of community, a sense of belonging. Uh, members of the elite do this. The ordinary people do not. And it was something, therefore, that was not just considered beautiful, but it also was considered necessary if you wanted to really belong uh, to the community of the nobles. In addition to that, to enhance your beauty, which appears to have been very important to the ancient Maya, you also could have uh, teeth inlays. And I'd like you just to see down here, um, those are jade inlays, and those, of course, would have been reserved for the elite. Uh, we have recovered a section of Tikal where workers uh, had their, I'm going to say, offices uh, or stores. And one of them was for a dentist who actually did do tooth inlays.